Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the Global Consciousness Project. I'm pleased to be with Dr. Roger D. Nelson, who was the director of the Global Consciousness Project, an international multi-laboratory collaboration founded in 1997, which aimed to study collective consciousness. From 1980 to 2002, he was coordinator of research at the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Laboratory at Princeton University. He is a longtime board member and past president of the Parapsychological Association. Once again, this interview has been conducted over the internet, and I'm going to switch over to that channel now. Welcome, Roger. It's a pleasure to be with you. I think uh, a good way to introduce your work might be to start right at, at the beginning. I think you joined the uh, PAIR unit at Princeton, the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Unit in 1980, I believe. That's right. I was teaching in a small college in northern Vermont and um, becoming a little concerned about uh, the direction that place was going and interested in research, I uh, started poking around and a friend of mine gave me some ads uh, to look at, one of which was this place in Princeton, New Jersey, uh, Princeton University, which I had heard of. <laughs> yeah. And um, they were looking for a cognitive scientist interested in the lesser known aspects of perception. And naturally, I thought of the sense of smell and touch and that sort of thing. And it turned out to be a great deal more interesting. It was the beginnings of what was called the Pear Lab, Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research, which was looking at consciousness. And mm -hmm. I was interested in that. I was vastly more interested in that than in aromas. <laughs> you, and you were a professor of psychology, and I believe your background also includes physics and engineering. Yes, I was uh, a good student in um, high school, and w when I went to college, I couldn't decide whether I wanted to be a physicist or a chemist, and eventually I became a sculptor. I didn't have time for uh, the physics, and so I switched to become a, a, um, a psychology major uh, or a sculpture major with a psychology minor, <laughs> and that's – and then – Years later, I went to graduate school to take um, the psychology part much further. Mm -hmm. So at Princeton, under the direction of uh, Robert John, uh, you became engaged in a, a program that lasted for a couple of decades using uh, random event generators for measuring uh, what parapsychologists call psi. Right. Um, random number generators, um, well, they weren't invented by Helmut Schmidt, but he put them on the map. Mm -hmm. He started doing experiments when he was a an engineer working for Boeing. He became very interested in the fact that it, they didn't seem always to be random, and he eventually correlated that with his state of mind and his intentions. And so he set about making some really good experiments to test whether uh, these kind of accidental observations uh, made sense or could be uh, validated. And not so long after that, um, Bob John uh, took up more or less the same question, set of questions as an engineer, uh, trying to find out if there was any reason to believe that human consciousness could interact with random number generators or sens sensitive technology in general because he was an aerospace um, engineer, among other things, and m knew that we should be concerned about all, all the technology in uh, cockpits of fighter aircraft, for example, which get to be very intense 
places psychologically. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, the development of uh, the random number generator or the random event generator came out of criticisms, I think, of the early card guessing experiments by J.B. Ryan having to do with the idea that simply shuffling a deck of cards didn't produce uh, an adequately random uh, sample of targets. Right. I guess there are a number of motivations or sources of that uh, work, but it, um, as our technology um, advanced, as we became more engaged in an electronic um, world with uh, computers and so forth, it became quite reasonable to think um, if we want to study consciousness in the sort of at the limits, what can consciousness actually do in the world? then uh, using the best uh, modern technology seemed to make a lot of sense. And that is um, maybe a very good description of random number generators in this kind of application. They can be made um, to operate as if they were a theoretical device. We can't tell the difference between a good random number generator, um, the output of a good random number generator and the theoretical expectation, unless you get some uh, human being there with conscious intention um, to somehow change the way the world runs in this uh, very refined technological space uh, to come up with something like um, a mind-machine interaction. Mm -hmm. Very fine tools. <laughs> uh, well, and perhaps for the benefit of our viewers, could you explain the difference between a random number generator and a pseudo-random number okay. generator? Right. Well, um, the kind of random number generators almost all of uh, psi researchers use are what we call true random number generators or physical random number generators. They use, in most cases, some quantum process. It might be radioactive decay, or it might be something like uh, pushing electrons against a barrier in an electronic circuit, uh, which produces a tiny voltage that shouldn't happen on the other side of the uh, barrier. This is the kind that we used in the pair lab. What we do is um, set up a circuit to, as I said, push the electrons against a, a switch barrier inside the diode. This tiny voltage that develops on the other side comes from what's called quantum tunneling, where a few electrons somehow, even though they aren't supposed to belong in that barrier, uh, wind up on the other side of it has to do with um, complicated uh, quantum processes. So in any case, a tiny voltage that's completely unpredictable develops on the other side of the barrier. We sample that and turn the high voltages into ones and the low voltages into zeros. And the whole thing is engineered so that it is completely unbiased and becomes a high-speed electronic coin flipper that... Um, is that produces pretty much exactly 50-50 on average ones and zeros. Now, a, a computer pro oh, and I should just emphasize again that the underlying process is completely unpredictable. It, it is a quantum process, and there is no way that even that process knows what the future will be. So we, nobody can predict it. It uh, comes into being only when it happens. Mm -hmm. A computer program that may produce what's called pseudo-random number generators is deterministic. It has an algorithm. So you push the button to start that algorithm, perhaps with some random seed, and then the algorithm cranks out what looks like a series of random numbers, but they are actually totally determined by the equations of the algorithm. Both of these have been used uh, for research purposes, but I guess uh, a pure random event or random number generator uh, is preferable. Well, it's preferable because it has this quality of being utterly unpredictable. Yeah, it, ha it has. There isn't, you know, any way you can um, change its behavior other than by intervening in a kind of in a quantum process that we don't even know how prep. How, how to describe, except uh, yeah. mathematically. I, I, so I, go ahead. They're, they're preferable because they are um, 
you know, predictably unpredictable. As I mentioned earlier, they say they do what they're supposed to do, theoretically. They are therefore very reliable. Well, uh, yes, they, yes the, the good ones, and people shouldn't do research with an, anything but the best quality instrument. They, 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 they cost, um, you know, the best quality in electronics um, is a very small price to pay in order to have reliable instrument. So a well-designed, a well-executed random number generator will do what it's supposed to do. And even though we have control conditions in most of our experiments, it is possible uh, with good random number generators to compare the behavior of the, of the device in the, an experimental situation where somebody is trying to get more ones or more zeros it's possible to compare what happens against the theoretical expectation mm -hmm. if it's a really good quality random number generator. Mm -hmm. Or I suppose if, if there's any uncertainty, you can run a control group. Right. We um, in the Pear Lab and also in the Global Consciousness Project always do control uh, tests or what we call calibrations. And in the Pear Lab experiments, we usually use what we call a three- way or tripolar protocol that had a high intention, a low intention, and a baseline. So the high intention is exactly what it sounds like. Try to get high numbers. By the way, we weren't looking, asking people to change ones and zeros. We were gathering 200 ones and zeros, 200 bits um, into a trial. And we asked people to try to change the outcome or the uh, mean value of those trials to become higher or lower than 100, which is the expected value. Mm -hmm. So um, the baselines, we, what we told people for the baselines is let the machine do what it does, you know, let it be. Mm -hmm. It turned out that lots of people in our um, uh, somewhat irascible crew of operators, we call them, not subjects, um, tried very hard to get good baselines, and they did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The baseline variance was uh, smaller than it should have been in much of the pair database, mm -hmm. apparently because people were trying to, you know, make it come out kind of 50-50 exactly. <laughs> I, I see. So what we're talking about, I guess would, most parapsychologists would call psychokinesis, a, an effort of human intention to influence this uh, mechanical instrument, quantum mechanical instrument, um, without touching it in any way. Um, that, that's right. I mean, we... Uh, in the pair lab tended to use mm, what we thought of as kind of engineering language. Uh, we didn't talk about PK much, but mostly about uh, um, anomalous interactions or human machine interactions or sometimes mind machines uh, interactions. In any case, the idea was that there was going to be some kind of connection made or achieved uh, between the mind and the intentions of the person who's operating in our experiments and what happens to the data produced by these well-designed random number generators. Another interpretation uh, that's been offered, I think, for that research is that it's something called decision augmentation rather than psychokinesis, uh, suggesting, I, I guess, a precognitive effect of some sort. Right. Um, it's a, uh, a good model, partly because it's testable. And uh, the idea is that mm, somehow the mind can reach out uh, to, to determine what the uh, outcome of the experiment might be. And having that information about the future state of the system to press the button at the right time to achieve that state. Now, it's a, a pretty, as I mentioned, uh, you know, it's a testable model. It's pretty interesting, and um, lots of people have worked hard to hmm, determine whether that uh, explains things well or not. And um, it has, it, to my mind, uh, made even more complicated <laughs> a situation which is already very difficult to understand. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that uh, reaching into the future to get information about the future state of the system so you can manipulate the system now in order to achieve that, Sounds loopy. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, but it's not uh, loopy in the cycle, you know, in the strong sense. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of data fit that model. It t- turns out that the pair data do not fit that model. The, mm-hmm. uh, the psychokinesis or a random number generator data actually fit better a model of something that we don't, we never did think of as a kind of force like intervention, but a field like intervention. Possibly something mm-hmm. like the consciousness of the content or the intent in the consciousness somehow interacts with the system to make um, to make to produce changes or achieve mm-hmm. changes. And nobody, I think, has ever satisfactorily determined uh, what particular kind of model really uh, best explains these kinds of things. So I hope the this kind of research goes on into the future. Um, with more, more and uh, more bright minds uh, focused on it, because it's really an extraordinarily interesting thing. Are we reaching into the future and changing our present um, on the basis of future that future um, or precognized information, or are we interacting with the physical world in which we now are embedded, and in some fashion connecting our mental? state our mind uh, to the physical world in either case uh, any conventional interpretation involving electromagnetic signaling uh, has been ruled out it has been pretty pretty uh, nicely yeah. i think there's um there's always a little one should has to be careful about uh say never say never mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's possible that there might be some aspect and by the way, we're close also to another set of um, of uh, questions and propositions having to do with where does this effect come from? Um, a lot of people, and I think scientists are especially prone to this, look for a single source. So it could be that something like this uh, fut- future information acquisition, the precognition of the future, might be a part of the, of the situation. Certainly the intentions of not just the person who's called a subject or an operator, um, but of other people involved in the experiment may be actually in, um, instrumental, part of the system. Now, I'd like to think there are four different pieces to whatever um, one of these kind of unusual um, events or outcomes in an experiment is. One would be the nominal source, the thing that comes to mind, the operator or the subject sitting there saying, high numbers, please, I want high numbers, or the experimenter who would like the experiment to be interesting and um, may not be in the room or uh, even in any way aware of what's actually happening, but nevertheless has a vested interest, a kind of intention contract with the experiment, uh, so to speak, and then there's the something drawn really from um, what we found learned in physics in the last hundred years. The nature of the question you ask is very important. So part of the determination of what what the outcome is will be the form you use for the question. And then finally, I think that um, the universe laughs at us sometimes in order to keep our hubris at a modest level. <laughs> We have something that I think of as the kind of coyote uh, there, uh, which helps to explain why your experiment is going along wonderfully well, and then all of a sudden the results come out backwards for a while. Why would that be? And we don't know why that would be, uh, but it could be that the, that that we uh, need not to get ahead of ourselves. We need not to in- conclude that we know how it all works, yeah. because we don't yet know. Another possibility, I suppose, is that every person who reads about the experiment or learns of it, even people watching our interview today, could be uh, having a retrocognitive psychokinetic influence on that experiment. My God, you're a theorist, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, there, there, there are actually um, pretty serious efforts to, um, to embody those kinds of uh, thoughts. If there's an observer effect, um, and if it can operate retroactively, then there's, in some sense, it's some difficulty in limiting the number of stages of retroactive observation. 
that might influence the the um, you know the well the data that we get. Yeah. Yeah. So th- these studies at Princeton University ran for about 20 years. You accumulated a, an enormous amount of data. Many, many publications occurred. And, and then at some point that uh, research project sort of ran its course and you established a new program, the Global Consciousness Project. Right. I actually started that in 1997, mm-hmm. about t- 10 years before the the pair lab closed. It was not quite three decades, 27 years actually, that mm-hmm. the, the lab was in, in business. I retired from the lab in 2002 and really began spending, I had already been giving a lot of time to the Global Consciousness Project, but um, then my wife said, you're not retired. Don't, <laughs> don't try to, don't kid yourself because I was uh, deeply engaged in uh, making, in, in making the global consciousness project um, grow and prosper. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and to uh, sort of introduce people to the global consciousness project is probably useful to go back once again to the definition of the true random event generator and point out that somehow it seems as if the human consciousness is interacting with the device at a quantum physical level. Right. Uh, the, the There is a a sort of a step between the pair lab and the global consciousness project that's quite helpful, I think, in, mm-hmm. in thinking about this. Uh, we miniaturize things, gradually getting, um, an ability to give other people random number generators so they could do some replications or do their own studies and also ourselves to go out in the field with what ultimately became very tiny, um, devices which were perfectly good, uh, high quality random number generators, but now they were, uh, way smaller than the proverbial cigarette pack. They're more like a pack of matches, mm-hmm. uh, in size. And, um, with, uh, laptop computers getting smaller and smaller, we actually used for several years what was, what were called palm top computers. They were the first really portable ones. Mm-hmm. I, I carried them to Egypt. I carried them to Devil's Tower in Wyoming. Uh, my, my friends, Bob and Brenda, took them to the Metropolitan Opera. And in all cases, what we did was take continuous data, a stream of random numbers, a sequence that was unpredictable. Remember, these devices just do what they do. And um, we had, for various reasons, uh, came come to believe that if there was an intense kind of coherence among the people who were involved in something like an opera, the great arias bring people together and they I mean, everybody is singing the same tune, so to speak. And having and a place, strong emotional response, uh, yes, presumably, yeah. yeah. And what we've um, predicted and found was that if there is a uh, high degree of coherence in a group of people that a random number generator in their presence, even though they may not be paying attention or even know it's there, that that random number generator may begin to produce deviant uh, data sequences. So we call that experiment the field REG or field reg Mm -hmm. experiment. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was actually doing two things, a kind of double entendre. It was doing work in the field, but we, our model that we thought we were testing, and I still think we were testing, is that consciousness produces a kind of field. We can name it a consciousness field or call it a more usefully an information field. But it actually, in, um, in some theoretical musings that I and others do, uh, constitutes a potential source for structuring information that might be absorbed into an unstructured random event sequence. So what we found was that random data that should be a sequence wandering without any direction, a kind of drunkard's walk, that it might take on a trend and um, exceed the boundaries of 
what's likely for a true random number generator. And you began to get uh, positive data using the field REG studies. I, I should point out also that it, for people who may not know, REG, random event generator, is often used synonymously with RNG, random number generator. Right. <laughs> yeah, so we, we uh, actually did a a lot of those field re- field REG experiments, and they added up uh, tremendously. They, the The effect size was in, if you calculate it in a certain way that makes sense to me, mm-hmm. in terms of how much time is invested in producing it, um, they, it's, a, um, it's a larger effect than mm-hmm. what we saw in the laboratory experiments on average. I see. But we're talking about, identified um, events where there's, we expect there to be a resonant uh, gathering of m- mind or emotion, a coherence among the people. That's a um, definitional quality. We also did, we did control data. Mm-hmm. We went to shopping centers and railway stations and places where there's a buzz and a lot of um, activity, but no coherence. Hmm. And in those places, we found um, no deviation from the normal random um, sequences. Uh, and I suppose, I mean, it makes sense at one level. At another level, it, people I have argued, and I think it might be the case, that maybe just a single person is actually influencing it, the experimenter who knows what the conditions are. Right. There are plenty of people who think that. Um, and, mm-hmm. and because I was involved in those experiments, I, <clears throat> I've, I've thought about it quite a bit. <clears throat> and so um, and there, one um, way of dealing with this is to do you, the best you can to get the experimenter out of the experiment. Yeah. So you can, do, you can set up um, experiments where you give the device to somebody else who then goes to the uh, meditation session or the um, fabulous concert or whatever it is, and then you get the data back and do the analysis and so on. Of course, the experimenter is still involved. Mm-hmm. But um, I think I want to go back to this idea that the uh, there's mo- multiple sources. Mm-hmm. Yes, the experimenter is involved. Uh, you can't have an experiment unless you ask a question. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what the experimenter is doing, and that question inescapably becomes a kind of um, you know, a, a kind of cultivating factor or a, a discriminating um, imposition when you start looking at the experiment as a whole. Mm-hmm. We just have to accept that mm-hmm. and then try to do experiments that have the, the experimenter more and more distant from um, the operational experiment itself. And I think the Global Consciousness Project did, does that um, quite nicely in some respects, although there are people who think that's all Roger Nelson. <laughs> I just don't believe it. Oh, I should mention, by the way, that Roger Nelson's um, signature of achievement in um, dealing with random number generators is pretty modest. <laughs> hmm. Well, and that's useful data. And since you mentioned the word signature, I am reminded of an old study Dean Radin did where he used a neural network to look at the, what he called, I think, the psi signature of different operators and in a random event generator. And he, he took the results and divided them in two and used a neural network to see if they could match up the first half with the second half. And indeed there, it was statistically significant and it does suggest that each operator as you call them has has a unique signature that can be recognized yeah we had pretty good evidence for that in the in the lab even before uh, uh, dean's uh, beautiful experiment with the neural networks admirable um sort of confirmation of what we already knew from um uh, other more or, well, I guess you would say simpler analyses. Mm-hmm. The uh, the truth is that we are all individuals, and we have, you know, if you um, go through life, you will meet people that you re- resonate with, and uh, others uh, where that doesn't happen, you become friends in one case, and, and not so much in the other case. And um, the same thing seems to be true with experiments in uh, of this kind. There is a kind of 
I don't know whether I should say it's uh, anthropomorphic quality, but um, our operators uh, would often say, in order for me to make uh, my intentions known, I have to communicate with this device you've got sitting on the table. <laughs> And the best way for us to get uh, together and produce what we're trying to do here is to f love this device, mm. you know, feel some real emotional connection to it. And I, uh, I, by, uh, I think, even though we never did a formal kind of study to prove this, our uh, database of 100 operators or 130 or something like that altogether is, um, they became friends of the lab. They weren't treated like lab animals, but instead as kind of um, co um, co workers in the field of trying to figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so we learned from them um, by asking, you know, how, how was it? What do you think is happening? And how do you do what you do? And a lot of people would say, you know, I really just have to um, connect. Mm -hmm. We had a one a one particularly nice example of a certain form of that. We had one of the people that actually worked in the lab quite a bit. Um, tried and tried, and she wasn't having very much success. And so finally she got discouraged and said, well, I'm going to go ahead and do some more data, but I'm going to read a magazine. And so, of course, she got terrific results by doing that. <laughs> And then she went on to do um, a, quite a few more of uh, these individual experiments using this new mode of getting out of the way by reading a magazine, mm -hmm. set the intention, and then let it be. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things that we, I think, one of the clearest uh, messages we got from these experiments about how to, you know, go ahead and how to engage in an, an impossible task. Mm -hmm. Do the best you can. But the best you can do is to uh, set the intention and then uh, get out of your own way. Well, it sounds like good advice, and I can think of many other e examples uh, where it's applicable uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> in, in, in many other human activities, as a matter of fact. Uh, but now let's talk more about the Global Consciousness Project, because with that, you, you took the whole research paradigm to another level. Right. The... Um idea of the, some of the questions that arose when we're doing these field experiments were had to do with what would happen if the group that I'm monitoring is far away? Well, what would happen if I had two REGs there or 10? And so um, I had been thinking about, um, I, I'm a great fan of Teilhard de Chardin. Mm. And I long, long, long ago believed, came to believe that he was, quite right about human beings being un, in, unfinished in terms of evolution. And we would have another stage, and, and that he called to become the noosphere, a sheath of intelligence for the earth. And um, so I, this, that kind of thinking was rattling around. And at the same time, I was doing these field consciousness experiments, and they came together as the idea to have a, to, you know, to take the big step and see if we can't look for a global consciousness, a kind of, um, you know, maybe very um, inchoate or uh, very young mm -hmm. <laughs> global consciousness, but we might just say, um, you know, give it a whirl. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that in, in the world there will be, there are events that like a, a great concert, and the field experiments bring huge numbers of people into the same state of mind and the same set of emotions. So if there's a terrible, terrible tragedy, a zillion people will feel um, kind of compassion and empathy and so forth. And because of our modern technological mastery of the communication world, that happens kind of close to instantaneously all over the world. So my thought was, let's do a giant version of the field REG by making a, a permanent network of, of random number generators sitting in places all around the world and sending data back to a, a server in Princeton to be gathered into an archive that can then later be examined 
during events of great significance uh, to see whether there's any change in the data. Mm -hmm. And that's the simple um, explanation of why and then what we wound up doing in the Global Consciousness Project. So um, I s lots of several friends and many people in the uh, psychology, parapsychology community uh, became interested in, in this idea and um, several of us worked together to think about protocols and so forth and and then some so, <laughs> As people volunteered to host one of these devices, which came to be called Eggs. And it's a nice um, sort of uh, segue to uh, the, the first name of that uh, project, which was the Egg Project. Hmm. It was uh, my son was uh, a master programmer, and he did the architecture for all the software necessary to bring, you know, to collect the data and then bring it to the archive. <clears throat> and he said, you know, what you're doing is a little bit like an EEG. It's like the encep en electroencephalogram has a whole bunch of sensors stuck on a skull. It's attempting to get some idea of what's going on inside. So he says, uh, you know, of course, these aren't electronic devices in the sense that they're measuring anything electro el electrical. But your, um, your paradigm is very much like that. So let's think. Let's think of it as an electrogiogram. So, uh, Gaia being um, the name for the Earth uh, mm. that has been long used. So, uh, the, that uh, acronym for that, of course, is EGG. Mm. We thought it was too playful to um, use as a formal name, so it gave the project the Global Consciousness Project name. But our devices have been called eggs ever since. The archiving program that runs on the uh, central computer is called a basket. Of course, it collects the data from the eggs. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this has been running now for uh, over 15 years, maybe right. close, now, close to uh, 20, I guess. Yeah, it's 20 years, actually. Mm -hmm. It started in August of 1998, gathering data, and we are now past... Um, August in eighteen in twenty eighteen. Mm -hmm. So, it the formal part of the uh, project or the experiment was ended in late um, two thousand fifteen. I'd set the d intention to take um, five hundred formal experimental tests of mm -hmm. the basic hypothesis. So you're looking for events, I guess, that w might affect uh, what we would call global consciousness. I know occasionally there are events where maybe a billion people will be watching simultaneously on television. Right. Um, uh, one of the prototypes that um, I did before the actual, before starting the main project was uh, Princess Diana's funeral. Mm-hmm. And it was said at the time that there would be uh, probably more than a billion people, maybe two billion people paying attention through radio, television, and, and even direct presence to this, uh, you know, to the funeral of Princess Diana. Um, she was very much um, admired. There were mm -hmm. tremendous numbers of people all over the world who thought um, highly of her. So... We, I thought that would be a really good um, test of the notion that when a really large number of people share emotions, that we might get something like a consciousness field that could, could uh, be registered somehow in the data from our random number generator. So I just asked all of my friends and, and uh, colleagues uh, who use random number generators, please take data, send it to me, and I put it all together, and we got a, one of those traces that is not a random trace when, when in the combined data. A spike of some sort. Well, a, a spike that lasted basically over the whole six hours of the funeral ceremonies. Hmm. It's a, a spike, in this case, is just kind of a persistent deviation. Mm -hmm. Instead of wandering at the, uh, at the expected uh, zero deviation level, yeah. it wandered a little bit above that mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. And we, what we... Uh, the, typical way of um, sort of expressing that graphically is to add up the deviations cumulative, cumulatively until we um, have 
uh, you know, until we reach the end of the period for the formal experiment. And that's the same as testing for a z-score or a, a significant difference between the expected value and the actual experimental value. Now, I would imagine uh, at this point, as you're just starting out to uh, analyze the data, that statisticians and mathematicians will say, well, there are many different approaches you could have taken, and uh, you likely be accused of, uh, you know, uh, selecting post hoc, the approach that worked the best. Right. No, we, uh, we knew those kinds of questions. And in fact, we had our own questions about what would be a suitable kind of statistical, statistical test. And, um, <clears throat> we eventually settled on one primary test and then a couple of others that we might use for special purposes. But, um, all of the data from the beginning, even when we were in what we call the pilot, should properly call a pilot phase, were, um, you know, the experiment required that we register all the parameters, the beginning of the period of time, the end of the period of time, and the statistical test that would be used, all of that had to be registered before mm -hmm. the data were examined in any way. Mm -hmm. So it's been, um, that's a blessing because you can then rely on the interpretation of your statistical outcomes. Whereas if you start after the fact, you look at the day and you say, oh, well, there's an interesting spike. I wonder what it is. <laughs> a lot of people thought we should do that. Mm -hmm. Look through the data for interesting spikes. and um, But it was clear to me from the beginning that if you do that, uh, you will find some spikes to be sure. And then if they're significant, you will say, wow, I wonder what it is. And then mm -hmm. you can look at a very complicated an enormous world, yeah. and you find a hundred things, a thousand things it might be. Yeah, at any given moment, there's always something going on, especially right. worldwide. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. But that's... So our, our protocol um, mm. was set up so that we would get just a little statistical edge on the fact that there's going to be a great blossoming of activity mm -hmm. in the world. We had our very precise definition, and uh, we knew it wouldn't uh, do to do this test only once we knew so the next time a similar event came along we would do a very similar kind of definition of an experiment for that one and gradually build up a kind of um, protocol i mean a, pro a set of results where uh, yes there were other uh, things happening in the world but they're a little bit outside our boundary the boundary of our preset experiment or way outside and um, so they would wash out, you mm -hmm. might say, whereas if we had something going on in the, the time period associated with some kind of an event like, you know, a great celebration or a great tragedy, um, we would gradually build up where, it, where if there were any response, it would gradually build up and become quite a clear response mm -hmm. in a repeated um, experiment like that. And anybody can now go to the website of the Global Consciousness Project and see some 500 different events enumerated uh, along with the you know, statistical measurements uh, that you made in each uh, one of them, as well as the overall analysis. Right. And in about um, <clears throat> maybe something like two months, they will be able to acquire a book that describes all this and gives uh, wonderful examples of, <laughs> of uh, how it works you know, and a, a little bit of philosophy. So in uh, probably in February. Well, I, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> in, in fact, uh, we can consider this interview sort of a an advance announcement. So, all right, I'm yeah. sure I'm sure many of our uh, viewers will be interested in acquiring that book. Uh, that my thought about what's going on. Um, you mentioned uh, Tehard's uh, concept of the newosphere, and it suggests to me that underlying our normal physical reality is some something that um, physicists have occasionally called the quantum foam, a, a, a quantum mechanical level of reality beneath the, the normal uh, atoms and molecules that make up our macro world. 
And it would, it suggests that somehow when, uh, when global consciousness in one way or another becomes coherent, the quantum foam itself is influenced and that's what you're measuring. Um, I like that uh, picture because it's very close to the, the closest I come to theorizing. I take my uh, start from David Bohm, who, as you undoubtedly know, has a w- extremely well-developed and mathematically sound uh, model um, describing what he calls the implicate order, which is a yes. little like this quantum foam, <clears throat> in which everything exists in potential but which is totally inaccessible to us, except when it becomes manifest in our in the world we know and love. And that happens, he says, because um, there is, uh, if, if there's a need for some kind of like, uh, um, if there's a, yeah, if there's a need for information, or if there's a need for a new particle or whatever in our world, it, that can draw, from the implicate order, uh, guided by what he called a pilot wave and sometimes called active information. Mm -hmm. I'm personally three quarters convinced that we human beings are all, and probably all conscious beings, are uh, sources or centers of active information. What that amounts to is that, um, you know, we extend out into the universe um, as a field of uh, active information, potentially drawing things into being or potentially um, adding uh, some kind of information or structure to systems that um, need it. So, like, for example, if a person is a healer and then there is somebody who might be a thousand miles away <coughs> who's ill or injured and therefore slightly randomized, no longer structured the way he or she is supposed to be, the healer, a thousand miles away, can present to the universe a a kind of intention, a structured notion of health and well-being for the thousand mile away healee, and by um, presenting that information, that structured information to to the universe, it can go by way of active information to be absorbed into the system where it's needed to manifest the, the structure required for that person to become well or healed. So currently, uh, you must have, I'm guessing, a couple hundred eggs all over the planet. Well, actually, uh, the number of eggs that are active is gradually diminishing because I am uh, have not been adding new ones. And people... Um, you know, the hosts for the eggs um, need to do other things. Yeah. Um, so, and I am no longer running the formal experiment, but um, I I am continuing to run it mm-hmm. uh, because the it's because it's kind of a beautiful thing. <laughs> it's a, a tool mm-hmm. or an instrument that exists which can be used to like uh, take a particular kind of look at the world. Yeah. It's not. Um, it's not easy necessarily to interpret, but uh, you know, every time some big thing comes along, um, and I often hope that there will not be any, hmm. but there are. Yeah, um, I'm inclined to take a look at the at the data again, even though it's informal. I still use the same uh, procedures of um, just defining the event before. Uh, looking at the data, that sort of thing. Would do you have any uh, future plans to do additional research other than what you've described? Um, not really. I'm uh, always hopeful, and I and occasionally there's a um, um, an inkling of uh, possibility that there will be somebody um, or multiple people uh, come along with the idea that. And there's a pretty reasonable paradigm that might be pursued and there might be better ways to do it and so forth. And uh, so I get uh, communications from people uh, who have this idea and uh, I try to help them think about um, the questions and uh, so I basically encourage replication. Well, it would be great uh, if, if this experiment could continue another hundred years. I think we would learn a lot. <laughs> yeah. 
I don't think I will continue for another <laughs> hundred years, unfortunately. No, <laughs> but I'd love to see how things come out. <laughs> maybe you'll have to come back, but I would hope that we could find young people in the field who would want to keep yeah. this this sort of project going. Well, there are a couple of people who, uh, some of whom you may know. Um, Adam Curry has a has built something he calls a consciousness app, and one of the things it could do. Um, is uh, uh, gather global consciousness style data from lots and lots of uh, mobile phones or mobile devices uh, wandering around the uh, the, the world um, and put it, sending that all to a huge cloud database along with geographic information and um, the readings of the geomagnetic fluctuation levels and you know, all kinds of things mm-hmm. that might be correlated. No, things like, mm, what, the peaking Google search yeah. you know, <laughs> words are, things like that. Big data. Uh, but that hasn't happened yet, and it requires, mm-hmm. um, you know, substantial thought and maybe a, some in serious investment of yeah. energies to make something like that go. There's a young man in your neighborhood, I think, not sure, but he might be in Albuquerque, or even named... Brian Williams, I don't know if you've met him, Mm-mm. but he's been doing uh, a kind of mixture of field REG and GCP style experiments using data from my network um, for quite a few years. And uh, he he's one of the many people who have contributed, actually, analysis and useful ex- extensions to my work. He, for example, put together a, a collection of all the uh, what he termed global harmony events. These are things like meditations and religious holidays and anything that um, peace marches, that kind of thing. He found uh, more than a little over a hundred of those in my formal database, put them together asking, well, what does uh, a global harmony um, in context produce in um, the, in the, uh, th- and these data, and what he found was a, a very strong um, a one in a thousand kind of deviation overall. Mm-hmm. Some of the things don't go in the direction we predict. Some go uh, gangbusters in that direction. But the average over a large number of uh, similar kinds of experiments is a good answer to the question whether that kind of event matters to the global consciousness network. Mm-hmm. Well, you use the term paradigm, and it does seem to me that this uh, line of research with the random event generators is is a paradigm, and, and it's proven to be useful, and uh, probably we've only begun to scratch the surface of, of what we might yet learn from this paradigm. Oh, I, I totally agree. Especially, you know, when I was wandering around with this, um, they just, you know, my, my little purse with a palm top computer and a random number generator and a lot of batteries. <laughs> I, I was thinking, of where all could I go? And I, I wanted to go to the space station. I wanted to go to the deathbed of people uh, who w- were willing to be monitored as they were passing into the next domain. Mm-hmm. And I and so, you know, it's just like a completely um, un- endless unfolding uh, matrix of potential questions. Mm-hmm. I've often thought about parapsychology and psychology, other sciences, <clears throat> as uh, sort of like in the business of filling in squares in a giant matrix, uh, which if it was all full, we would be able to put together a pretty nice understanding. But in parapsychology, it's a big matrix, mm-hmm. and there's only a little spot here and a little one here and a little one here that have been filled very, very well. So I'm um, hopeful that the... I don't know. Uh, I, I, I would like um, my book. The, uh, I've also published one in uh, German that um, I, I would hope those might help people. And my website, in my presence, yeah. <laughs> anybody that wants to listen to me is going to get <laughs> encouragement to pay attention to this kind of research at the edges of what we know. Mm-hmm. If that's where the good stuff is. I, I would think some of the corporations dealing with big get data, you mentioned Google as an example, would, would find that this would uh, dovetail very nicely with the research they're already doing. 
I would think so. And it may, um, people ask me sometimes, uh, is the military interested? Hmm. And I don't have any formal relationship with the military, <laughs> but I know that a uh, long time ago they started looking, and uh, but we, I don't hear anything about it. Yeah. The same, same thing with Google. It's possible that they're interested, but um, it, it's a little bit like the main, you know, parapsychologists often feel a little bit, I guess, um, sad because they can't get attention from mainstream researchers. It would be nice if there were more smart people looking at these questions. And I think a long time ago I decided that the real problem here is that everybody's already got a full plate. Yeah. And if you're a psychologist uh, doing experiments on um, brain reactivity to flashing lights or whatever, that's what you do. And you don't have much room for um, somebody waving a random number generator at you. So uh, it, there's, there's probably less antipathy or hostility than we imagine and more potential interest. But the, we have to somehow uh, hope that we'll come up with some kind of uh, experiment that just uh, blows the socks off in such a way that people will say, wow, i got to try that myself. That's well, where most mm -hmm. of us who have been in this field came from anyway. In summary, it's fair to say you've been working with random event generators now since about 1980. That's uh, close to 40 years, and you've uh, consistently been getting uh, significant data throughout that period. Um, well, I would say inconsistently getting significant data. <laughs> because <laughs> there are some uh, very you know, notable um, backwards performances. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, and, and they're not they're not uninstructive. They're very uh, helpful. It turns out that meditation, certain kinds of meditation in the Global Consciousness Project database, typically have a downward trend that is a, a negative deviation instead of a, the positive deviation we predict. Mm -hmm. So in the formal database, they subtract from our bottom line, mm -hmm. but they're still there, of mm -hmm. course. And... Um, in in the laboratory experiments where you have you know more refined controls over what happens, you can look for the exact for the variables that really matter. And I'll give you just one quick example. We we had an operator who um, did uh, well. We had two ways of choosing the intentions or having the intention. One would be I pick my own high versus low versus baseline next. The other mode is to have a random process tell me it's now high, it's now baseline, now low. Mm. <clears throat> this person did magnificently well when uh, choosing <laughs> her own in intention and direction and went backwards as strongly as she had gone forwards when she was told what to do. <laughs> mm. You can see, uh, you know, it's... Um, well, it's only one case, but it's the kind of it is the kind of case that says here's a good question to ask. Yeah, and and it also suggests that the individual signatures can give you some uh, insight into the psychological makeup of, of that person. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We even went so far as to speculate that we had a uh, a kind of. Uh, mood detector or a psychological state detector mm -hmm. for a while. But we, um, you know, pursued that notion long enough to realize we were, we were way ahead of the evidence. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's the sort of thing that just requires more researchers and, and more research. Yeah, yeah. And we look forward to seeing that. Yeah. I mean, you've really kind of been carrying the ball along with a uh, handful of a, a few dozen colleagues. But uh, as you point out now, the, the formal research has ended. So uh, it's time for uh, other people to begin to uh, take on the mantle that you uh, have established. Well, I hope that happens, and uh, if if that doesn't happen, then I hope something even better does. Mm -hmm. Well, Roger Nelson, what a pleasure to share this time with you and to review a, a very important career in the history of parapsychology. Yeah. Thanks for being with me. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to this conversation, Jeff, and I wish you the best for the holidays. The same to you.
Thank you.